Uh, thrilling to be here uh, yet again uh, at TabConf. Um, I'm Nick Tucker. I'm from Bitcoin Depot. We're the industry leader in the crypto kiosk market. Uh, we are founded right here in Atlanta, Georgia, and we actually just passed a huge milestone for the company in the form of 5,000 active kiosks across the United States and Canada. Um, so really, really thrilled to see the explosive growth in the last couple of years. Uh, I joined the company when we were at 250 kiosks just two years ago. Uh, it's really stunning to see. Uh, I have one of my coworkers here actually today, Ken Rick. He's one of our amazing uh, account managers. And yeah, we're glowing, blowing up really, really quickly. Um, what I'm here to talk about today is uh, really just a reminder of why this technology was created in the first place, who can get the most use out of it today, uh, who the technology was uh, invented to really combat. Uh, and again, just what I think the best, most powerful use case is for crypto. And that also happens to be Bitcoin Depot's number one customer. That person is the unbanked. The unbanked meaning they have no connection to a bank account, financial institution, no one's storing their money for them. So uh, just a little background on why I'm so interested in Bitcoin, blockchain tech. Uh, it frees all of us, right? It gives power back to the individual. That's the entire essence of this technology is empowering individual people. It gets rid of those intermediaries, the people that feel as though they should get their cuts at every turn, every time you want to transfer, exchange, whatever it might be. Uh, it, it's very exciting to, to see that. Uh, most of my training and experience in being an evangelist for this technology and really having these conversations of helping people understand what it is, because it can be very tough to grasp at first, most of this experience comes from working at the Atlanta Bitcoin Embassy. And for those of you uh, who never attended or don't know about it, the Atlanta Bitcoin Embassy was an in-person community here in Atlanta, all based on the idea of adoption, training, helping people conceptually understand just what is Bitcoin and why does this matter? Why are we hearing about it constantly? Why are people so pumped up about this tech? And I, I had a problem in the first couple months of working at the embassy and I think it's a problem that many of you might be able to relate to. I think we can all remember a time in which it's a little bit difficult to know what is it about Bitcoin that is particularly impactful? What is the 20-second elevator pitch for Bitcoin? And the truth is it kind of changes on what the use case is, on who it is that you're speaking to. Do you speak about the scarcity? Maybe it's the security of Bitcoin. Maybe it's the investment opportunity. But, you know, the most powerful conversations that I was having, the conversations where people within just like 20 seconds, they got it. They understood what the value proposition was. That was with the unbanked community. Uh, you know, I didn't have to get into the concept of money. I didn't have to start freaking people out and talking about how, you know, there's no gold back in the U.S. dollar. You know, nothing's really backing this. I didn't have to have those conversations. I didn't have to talk about Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations. I just showed them a better product. And it was, uh, it was very exciting to see. Um, so part of the reason I'm here today uh, giving the speech is that I'm extremely passionate about my work at Bitcoin Depot and reaching that unbanked population. Part of it is my interest in blockchain. Part of it is that passion for the unbanked communities and the inefficiencies and tough lives that I see they're living. But I must admit, part of it is also a little bit selfish. And the reason I say that is I had a recent experience. Uh, I, an idiotic 24-year-old, just this last month became unbanked. That's right. For 10 days in October 2021, I was unbanked. And I'll tell you how this happened. I took a uh, quick little trip down to Sayuita, Mexico. It's a small little surf town, 5,000 people or so, 40 miles north of Puerto Vallarta on the west coast. For anyone that needs a vacation, a couple of days to relax, you want delicious food, beautiful people, lots of fun, amazing scenery, it's, it's a wonderful place. But um, please learn from my mistakes. Uh, if you go for surfing, you don't know what you're doing, just get the instructor. Just do it. It's well worth the time. 
I uh, decided I needed no such instruction, despite never having surfed a day in my life. And so I snagged the hotel surfboard and hopped out there with the locals. Within the thir 30 minutes or so, I managed to knock two of the locals off of their surfboard, flying into the ocean. I, as you can imagine, I was extremely popular with these people. And I don't know what it is. Maybe you guys can relate. Uh, getting cursed out in Spanish. It just, it hurts much more. It stings. I'm not quite sure what that is. But uh, I, while I was in Sayuita, I used an ATM. And I had heard about some of the dangers of using ATMs in uh, foreign countries, but I didn't really think much of it. We were generally in nice areas, going to decent pharmacies. So anyway, I made a few transactions and didn't think much of it. I got back to the United States. Within three weeks, I had a fraudulent transaction on my card. And the bank fortunately caught it. For someone who's a big proponent of blockchain technology, Bitcoin, I was actually oddly grateful for the bank for having caught this transaction. But the downside, of course, was my card had to be canceled on the spot. So seven to 10 business days, they told me, we'll have a card to you in the mail, we'll get you up and running again. Okay, great, not the biggest deal. I can maybe handle this seven to 10 days of using cash for gas and groceries. There are worse things in this world. Uh, and I did do that. I took out cash and it's not the worst experience. I mean, it absolutely is inconvenient, right? To use cash for daily transactions, to have the amount you need on you at all times. Uh, there is a you know, sense of security. And I was definitely on edge for those first few days of bringing out a giant wad of cash in stores. But uh, I found my problems truly began uh, on the third or fourth day when I realized that I was completely pushed away and cast aside from all of the tech innovations that we really take for granted nowadays. Uh, with my less crypto savvy friends, I was unable to exchange wealth in the form of say Cash App or Venmo. Uh, one of the particularly brutal effects of not being unbanked was uh, my inability to pay for YouTube premium. If I see one more ad about the Papadia, I'm going to lose my mind. Uh, so lots of uh, very, very tough struggles for me as an unbanked person. I was unable to uh, buy my monthly Nespresso packages. If you try to buy these things with cash, it cannot be done. And I believe that an Nespresso hot and fresh first thing in the morning is just about one of the greatest innovations I've seen in my lifetime. So I was subjected to tea for those 10 dark, cold days in October. So to any of the unbanked who are out there who feel as though they're unseen, they're unheard, uh, no one's in their corner. Just hear this, I am one of you. And of course, I'm being facetious and playing around. I am not Bitcoin Depot's number one customer, but it was a very sobering reminder about uh, just how inefficient and inconvenient this life becomes. So who is the actual unbanked? Uh, I didn't realize how big this community was until I started the embassy. In Atlanta alone, 40% of the people inside the perimeter of the city are unbanked, meaning they don't have that connection to a traditional financial institution. Uh, worldwide, this makes up nearly a third of the world's population does not have that connection. Uh, and the America, it's millions and millions of people. And the really troubling part of this is that the people who are affected but the people who are forced to use, shall we call it, uh, second-rate financial services, they're the exact people that cannot afford to take those hits. The average household income for an unbanked household is $25,000. These people are spending about 2500 of that on fees every which and way they move their money. So about 10% of their annual income goes towards these intermediaries, towards those fees. And this takes the form of money order costs, check cashing, money transfer fees. There's this whole second rate market that is not very transparent, uh, not very upfront, and really is astonishing uh, the fees that they're tacking on to these people. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, something that really is not so terrible is the uh, prepaid debit card model. And it does give some freedom to the individual. It allows people to get, at very least, a direct deposit from their, uh, from their company, right? It allows them to at least have some kind of a digital asset that they can swipe conveniently. But of course, there's fees with this, just like everything else, and they add up to hundreds of dollars per year. 
On the other end of the spectrum, one of the more egregious, malicious, and even predatory services that we see is the payday lending model. For those of you who aren't familiar, right, these people will offer you a very quick and speedy loan. They're very eager to give it to you based on the amount in your upcoming check. And the problem is, like everything in the second-rate industry, uh, they're not very forthcoming with what those fees are. And good Lord, if you are uh, delinquent on a few payments, the fees add up very quickly. The interest rates can be up to 500% for these services. And that's just about as bad as I've seen in this industry. It's truly disgusting. Uh, another huge downside to the unbanked lifestyle and a barrier to living a free, full life is lack of access to the credit system. Right? Most of us are building credit by getting a credit card. Uh, well, you know who is not getting approved for a credit card. That is the unbanked. So you're unable to build credit, get a loan at some kind of a reasonable interest rate. You're uh, unable to get financing for a home or a car. It severely limits what your abilities are. So I think we have to ask the question, why are people unbanked? Why do people choose to exist like this? Why are they living in this clearly inconvenient lifestyle that is just taking an incredible amount of their annual income? I think we can point to a few different reasons here. Uh, education is absolutely one of them. Uh, and not education in the sense that people know that banking exists or that a bank account would be more convenient. Um, it's really just that we don't have any kind of financial literacy programs in the United States. Uh, so we, we need something, something to kind of push people to get into this industry. And uh, it doesn't exist right now. Another huge reason that people are not becoming banked is simply that uh, they don't feel like the banks are set up to work for them. Uh, Low-income people, and it's very true, right? The high barrier to entry in the form of minimum deposits, minimum account balances, it's very intimidating for someone that is making that $25,000 per year. So uh, with these two things, what I noticed in my time at the embassy and speaking with unbanked people was that there is a huge culture, uh, very pronounced, and a pronounced culture of distrust with the banks, that they are not set up to help these people. They are not their friends. They're not transparent. In fact, the unbanked seem to believe that this industry is set up to fight against them. And really, I, I do agree with the unbanked. Um, the bank is not particularly transparent. They're not up front. They don't try to educate new users, they uh, really, the attitude seems to be, hey, you should have known. This is the way things are. And there's just a few mistakes you can make in the uh, banking industry. Say you get started and maybe you're unaware of the dangers of overdraft fees, whatever it might be. A few basic banking mistakes can get you blacklisted from them for a decade or more. So uh, another particularly nasty effect we're seeing from the bank, and I think a very good example of how people are uh, not catering to the unbanked is the bank closures that we've seen in the last decade or so. Um, we're seeing low-income bank branches close at a rate of three times that of a middle-income or high-income area. Uh, they are targeting these communities and out of their own self-interest, right? They are worried about their margins and moving towards that more uh, contactless model, but they're not thinking about the ramifications. Uh, economists, uh, economists estimate that what is it, 13, there's a 13% drop in overall small business loans issued in an area. And that effect is very quick within the first 12 months and takes over half a decade to recover from. So uh, it is a very real problem. These people are, uh, are um, kind of pushing these people out. And all these problems I've mentioned were bad before the pandemic. They have only gotten worse with uh, the last 18 months or so. People have been unable to receive relief uh, for you know, unemployment benefits because they don't have that direct deposit set up. And you know, banks, again, they just seem to have forgotten this in the age of COVID that the small business and the bank have traditionally come together, built that relationship, built on trust. They've completely forgotten that. So, I know I've painted a somewhat dreary view of the world here, but we have every reason to be optimistic and hopeful for the opportunities presented to this community. Um, just this Wall Street betch drama we saw in the last few months, it was really stunning to see like the anti-establishment 
kind of ethos of all of this. People are fighting back. People are looking for different options. It's not to say that crypto isn't subject to some of those same issues, uh, but it's a fresh start and an ability for people to uh, start fresh and, again, just try to be more transparent with what some of the ramifications of these financial services might be. So I'm being told to wrap it up. Uh, I'll leave you with this. Um, the banks know that we are on their necks. They know that we're coming. They are very aware that we offer a better product. And if they don't, they're already done. They just don't know it yet. So it's truly, together we are strong. If you're passionate about this message, get to work in this industry. Be an evangelist for the technology. Do things like attending this conference here today. You don't have to be a coder. You don't have to be in tech. I work in sales operations at Bitcoin Depot, and it's incredibly gratifying because I know each kiosk we're putting out reaches more and more of these unbanked people. So thank you for your bravery, your initiative, passion in joining this fight. And thank you for sharing our vision of bringing crypto to the masses. Thank you very much.